Farms here in Traverse City. We are a distributor of all made Michigan grown and uh, produced foods. It is my pleasure to introduce Maureen Dusek from Beaumont and Grant Fletcher from Bronson Medical Center, who are two of the leaders in our hospital movement toward bringing in whole, fresh, and local food. Both of them have done taking different approaches, doing a lot of work, and they are the leaders in our state. So Maureen's going to start, I do believe. So without further ado. Good afternoon. So Grant and I have been doing this duet a few times, probably over the last year. And the amazing piece of that is that each time I learn something new from him, I'm like, when did you start doing that? And how are you doing that? And hopefully he's learning the same thing from me. So that's the cool thing, that more and more is happening. And more and more opportunities are presenting themselves as we move through this process. The other uh, warning I will give you, a little bit of the dietitian came out in me when I was writing my presentation. So there's a little bit of nutrition education <laughs> in, this, uh, in this presentation. It did say nutrition somewhere in our, in, our in our description. Oops. So that's me. So what I want to talk about today is why we want to buy and serve local, why it's important to us, um, what nutritional needs drive that focus what barriers we've had and how they're starting to break down, um, how we started, where we're at now, and where we hope to be in the future, and then um, how we network at the state and local um, uh, uh, levels to be able to get more opportunities and um, describe the use and marketing of local products within the institution. So you see my Cultivate Michigan sticker here, and then I have this. And I should have put my bone on badge. I feel like a NASCAR person with all my, all my little sticker things here. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of where I'm coming from, I'm at Beaumont Hospital Royal Oak, which is in a suburb north of Detroit. It's a very large hospital. Um, there's uh, 60,000 admissions a year, 300,000 patient days. We serve about 5.5 million meals a year at our institution. We have over 10,000 employees themselves right on our campus. So we have a, a lot of people around, lots of patients, lots of meals going down. <laughs> so why do we buy local? Because we focus on healthy food choices. Um, I took a little bit of exception to some of the discussion this morning because um, Grant and I at least are really trying to make the movement to having more healthy choices within our hospitals and within our uh, what we offer. So uh, because it supports disease prevention, attaining optimal health, and, and models more healthful nutrition practices. We are a hospital, we need to be teaching people how to eat healthy. Um, also, we wanna support local and state agriculture, having access to fresh whole foods, um, decrease the environmental footprint, and supporting our local economy, our Michigan economy. And also, we have initiatives at Beaumont that we are committed to, that we sign off and say, yes, we're willing to do this. Things like the MA, Michigan Hospital Association initiatives, Healthcare Without Harm initiatives, Healthy Food and Healthcare, that being that, and then Healthier Hospitals initiative, which is a nationwide, actually, uh, initiative. So how do we define local? Um, for Healthier Hospital initiatives, it's within anything within a 250 mile radius of our hospital. If it's a processed food or a combined food, more than half of the ingredients have to be within a 250 mile radius of it. So that's, that's the tricky part when you start looking into ingredients and how much of it is you know, from Michigan versus or within 250 miles of us. So that's for the HHI Cultivate Michigan, and I, I'm taking a, a licensure here because there's not strictly a definite definition yet, but I told them yesterday at the advisory committee that I made one up. So it says, food from farms, ranches, and production processing facilities within the state of Michigan. So that's gonna be the broad definition for today, that's what I mean. <laughs> Oops. So what is the nutritional need for fresh local foods to help avoid nutrition-related chronic diseases? We've already heard this morning many times um, how nutrition impacts how healthy and healthful we are through the rest of our life. So when you have chronic diseases, there's increased demand on health care. It negatively impacts productivity and quality of life. And it's prominent in the top 10 cases, causes excuse me, of death in the United States. So this is from the most recent CDC stats that I could find. Um, obviously, between two, the 2013 and 2014, 14 is the green. Um, heart disease, number one killer. Cancer, number two. 
As you look down the list, many of these related to nutrition. One factor in nutrition is how much we eat and versus how many calories we use, and you know that we have an obesity epidemic in our country. So obesity itself is associated with all these chronic diseases like uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, the whole long list there. The medical cost of obesity is growing. It's almost, in, by uh, 2030, they expect it to be almost 16 to 18% of healthcare costs, related, factors related to us being obese. This is the 2000 most recent data that I've seen for prevalence of self-reported obesity. And you know many times when you're reporting, you're probably a little more generous with yourself than if it's an actual thing. But regardless, Midwest states are in the 30 to 35% range of people who are obese. We now have three states in the country who are more than 35%. So it's definitely an issue. So here comes the dietitian part. Um, <laughs> New dietary guidelines just came out. How does that relate to us here today? Most of them talk about eating healthy, what, you know, better diet. So top 10 things to do to meet the guidelines. Yes, people have already spoken out that there's certain issues with the guidelines and people are questioning things, but you know, nothing's perfect. So this is a good framework. Lifetime of healthy eating helps prevent chronic diseases. Healthy eating is a powerful tool to reduce the onset of disease. Following, follow a healthy eating pattern that's right for you. Don't try to do something that's not comfortable and you're not gonna be able to sustain. And the three healthy eating patterns that they actually recommend are healthy US, uh, life, US style eating pattern, the Mediterranean style, and then the vegetarian eating pattern. All of these are very plant-based diets. So healthy eating patterns include vegetables, fruits, especially whole fruits, grains, at least half of which are whole grain, fat-free or low-fat dairy, and then a variety of proteins, including plants and lean animal products, and as we heard this morning, eggs are bad. That's the problem with nutrition uh, information, you know. Butter's bad, margarine's good. Margarine's bad, butter's better. Oh, well, use olive oil, you know. Eggs are bad, eggs are good. But right now, eggs are back. And oils, including those from plants. Um, healthy eating patterns limit added sugars, uh, less than 10% of your calories, saturated and trans fats, again, less than 10% saturated fat. And for adults, they recommend less than 2,300 milligrams. Some recommendations go as low as 1,500. Um, number eight is making small shifts in eating habits over time. Remember physical activity, and everyone has a role. Every, all of us have a role in a healthy eating pattern, environment, home, school, workplace, community, and retail food outlets. So that's the dietitian portion of the, of the speech. So what are barriers to local purchasing? Sometimes for us, being in southeastern Michigan, a large hospital that goes through large volumes of product, it's actually access to local farmers. We have to reach out further to get to them. Um, traditional farm stand selling, sometimes when I found farmers, they are used to selling at farm stands. They're not as comfortable moving to like, how can I trust this institution? If I grow this stuff, how can I trust them to buy it? Um, volume of product required for us because of our size. Um, sometimes need for processing. We actually have um, what is called an ingredient room. So we, we as a hospital do a lot more processing than most hospitals do. But in many cases, hospitals need that product already processed for them. Pack sizes. When we first started buying blueberries, this was all that we could get were these little things. We're going through massive volumes of blueberries and having staff to open and do, you know, no, we need cases. We need something much bigger than that. So pack sizes can be an issue. Um, our payment process, obviously we are not going to be able to pay cash right away and sometimes with a, a purchase order process there's a delay in payment. So, I mean, not a long delay, but, you know, a smaller farmer needs his money, needs it quickly. Um, and then the need for safety certification. So we require GAP certification for all of the produce that we buy. And sometimes they don't have that. <clears throat> what have we done historically? Our prime vendor did have some tools to help us get to local purchasing. Didn't really work out real well. Um, we highlighted local uh, products and weekly bid sheets. I'll show you what that looks like. Finding alternate sources for purchasing local and then bringing local vendors actually to the hospital. 
So this was our initial prime vendor tool. Um, it would show us uh, stuff from Ohio and Michigan. Um, there wasn't usually a lot on the list that was local. Um, and that's just another example of their fresh craft report that they were using. But what we did was we actually bid out our produce once a week. And we made the, um, and this is from, well, you can see a lot of Michigan on there, so it was in September. So that's why September of a, a year ago, but this is how it works. So when it goes out on the, pro, on the bid sheet, we make the people that are bidding to get our produce by uh, identify any Michigan products that are on their list. So I will drive my purchasing towards the ones that say Michigan on them. Finding alternate sources, we made a relationship with Kelly's company, uh, Cherry Capital Foods, to buy items, particularly we're buying frozen uh, product because one of my goals is to be year round. I started with my blueberries, you know, I want Michigan blueberries during the fresh season, but I want to buy frozen blueberries in, you know, in the season when they're not fresh. So we did that. There was another initiative that local, that local Orbit and Eastern Market tried. Um, we did that for about two years. It wasn't highly successful, but I'm always looking for different avenues for me to get to local produce. So I'm basically, they all know I'm basically willing to try anything once to get there. <clears throat> we also have our own local, our own farmer's market. It's once a week, May through October. So we bring the farmers to us. Um, we do a Friday featured food, so we buy from one of the farmers on Thursday um, and serve it in the cafeteria on Friday. So staff know we, we identify this as one of our, our uh, market vendors' uh, produce. So uh, we also do a week, weekly market memo with nutrition information and recipes and things like that. And we're also a member of MIFMA. And then we do the Michigan Apple Crunch. We've done it for the last two years. And for that, we do a direct buy from a local orchard. So we bought 80 bushels of apples from that orchard for our, uh, because we not only serve them, we give them free, obviously, to the staff. You know, remember, we have 10,000 employees on campus. But we also have outbuildings, and we shipped Michigan apples to the outbuildings so that they could do their own Michigan apple crunch. So we've done that for two years. And that's a picture you'll recognize. Some people, if you can see them on there, that's Hillary from uh, and Nikki, I don't know if you know Nikki left. No, that's last year. Oops, this one goes too fast. Okay, so currently we're still doing the local produce, uh, you know, identifying Michigan products, um, using regional distributors like Kelly, looking for other opportunities there, direct buy whenever we can in our farmer's market. <coughs> but, but last year in, um, well, actually, probably towards the end of 2014, I was getting very frustrated with not being able to increase my level of, of local purchasing through my prime vendor. And, I, and everybody says, you know, you can't get these prime vendors, you know, get them on board, you can't get them on board. So I basically went to them and I said, I'm a very large volume customer for you. I need more local opportunity. So what are you going to do for me? This, we had our first meeting in February. And, and they actually listened um, to me, <laughs> strangely enough. I can be very persistent when I want to be, if you can't tell. Um, but anyway, so I got in a room with one national person from this um, major distributor and about eight or 10 other uh, regional people from them, and then my local person that I deal with. And the first thing is always, well, everybody has a different definition of local, so what are we gonna use? I said, I have a very clear definition of local. It's the HHI definition, so you know, don't tell me I don't have a clear definition of local. I have a clear definition. So then they, you know, like, so we went around, talked about it, and actually I invited all of them to come and tour my facility. We went through every cooler, we went through every storeroom, and identified products that I was buying that either were local or could be local. We found a couple actually processed products like applesauce that I didn't know were 95% Michigan apples. So more than half of it was local. So now that I count as local, but also looking for them to give me opportunities. What else can you do for me kind of thing? So what came out of that was a partnership with Pearson Foods, who is a processor. Um, and I met, actually just met the Pearson guy yesterday at the meeting. So there is a, well, I'll show you the list, but so the produce comes from Michigan Farms. They're all GAP certified. So they're doing the certification for the major distributor who happens to be Gordon. Um, so Pearson is doing all this, the 
verification of the gap certification and all of the other requirements. So the farmers um, get it to Pearson, Pearson does the processing and the packaging, and then it goes to Gordon Food Service. Pearson doesn't come as far as I am away from them, so it's Gordon Food Service that brings it to me. So this is the new model that we are going to be working on. We actually, so I told you I met in February. In July is when Pearson and Gordon actually started getting together. And so the program, unfortunately, didn't actually get off. Uh, the train didn't start until October. Well, you know, Michigan, October. <laughs> Not so much happening, you know, we're, we're getting into the frozen now, you know. But anyway, it, at least it was a start. So we got a product list of 30 products in a variety of cuts and packs, and there were 11 farms on this list participating. We got labeling, so this is what the label looks like when it comes to me, <coughs> tells me where it is, when it was packed, um, what the Gordon number is, uh, who, where it came from, what farmer it is, and then um, the uh, Pearson Foods was the packer. And it's accessible to um, all Gordon Food Service institutions, so any institutions, schools, or hospitals are able to buy from this list and it's identified on our order sheets. So this is an example of, it's not the whole list, but this is what the list that they presented to us looks like. So there's a variety of different farmers. In addition, for our marketing piece, we get um, farmer profiles to be able to use so that our, we can tell our customers, okay, your whatever, your peppers came from Ruler Farms or anyone. So they have them for each farmer that they use. So. Um, that's a great marketing tool for us. So what are we looking at in the future? What's in the works now? I actually met with Eastern Market folks right before Christmas. Um, they are working on a grant to be able to um, build a processing facility for to have more frozen Michigan vegetables available. So um, they wanted to meet with me and see what my needs were, so I sent them a list of what my top 10 things would be that I want. So that's coming up. And then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna work through the rest of this process with Pearson Foods, get that rolling again in the spring when there is Michigan produce actually available again. They don't do frozen, they just do fresh. Um, so it actually only ran from October to December. Um, and, but we'll, we'll start up in the spring again. <coughs> we have plans to, to do a lot with them. <coughs> so look, always looking at new, uh, I'm to the point where people are now finding me instead of me having to go find them, so that's a good thing. <laughs> instead of me chasing this around, sometimes I have actually people coming to me. Um, and then other direct buy opportunities, always open to be, you know, but distribution is usually an issue, even if the farm is large enough to supply me and have their gap certified, a lot of times getting it to me um, where I am is difficult. So how do state and local networks help? I am on the advisory board and the outreach committee for the Michigan Farm to Institution Network. So I get to hear about all the great things that are going on, uh, are going, happening around the state. Can't talk today. Um, so this links farmers and food suppliers, institutions and eaters. So we have people in the room who are like the, the Kellys in the world who are the kind of the mid-level size distributors. We have a large distributor, a major distributor there uh, from U.S. Foods. We have farmers in the room. We have MSU Extension people in the room. And then we have the buyers like me in the room. So we all talk about how are we going to make this happen. So part of this Michigan Farm to Institution Network is the Cultivate Michigan campaign. So this is an actually a way for us to be able to highlight Michigan products um, each year, four foods are picked. This, we're, we're coming into our third year. So we, as part of that, um, the Michigan Farm to Institution Network partners with people to get us information that we can use to promote these project, products. So we get food facts, we get purchasing guides, we get promotional materials, and we also get recipes. We submit recipes, but we also get recipes. So I have little things like, oh, and I didn't bring them. Uh, I have little clings that I put on my salad bar that say cultivate Michigan and then blueberries or whatever the, the featured food is. So the first year in 14 it was asparagus, blueberries, tomatoes, and apples. Last year it was milk, peppers, winter squash, and we're still doing dry beans um, now. This year in 16 it will be kale, carrots, potatoes, and for winter it's dried and frozen cherries. 
So how do we feature local foods at the hospital? Um, in, uh, we use them in patients, retail and catering functions. Um, we incorporate, we make sure that we incorporate Michigan ingredients when we're making recipes. We use our menu boards and signs, our farmer's market memos and other hospital communication tools, things that go out to the entire population. And then we also have our volunteer garden. So in our patient services, um, we do a weekly special for patients. We are on a room service system. So we have one standard menu, um, but we weekly provide a special that the patients can order from. So when we do that, we will say that, oops, that our cream of asparagus soup is made with fresh Michigan asparagus, or that our Michigan cherry salad has dried Michigan cherries in it. So we're featuring, and our customers are asking, you know, where are things coming from? So the ones that we, and the Michigan blueberry buckle. So we're identifying on these patient specials, um, even on our standard menu, things that I know I can have year round, um, we will identify as Michigan, like apples. Now we identify that they're gonna get a Michigan apple on the standard menu. And Grant talked about combining for his, we're gonna have a new menu this year as well, and he's going to combine his heart healthy and his regular. And we actually have, a, we had already done that with our, our menu several years ago, but what we did was we put hearts on everything that, that met the Heart Association guidelines. And this time we decided, we have so many hearts on there, I think we're gonna just say it's a heart healthy menu and identify the couple things that are on it that aren't heart, heart healthy. Mm -hmm. So I took a little exception to the thing about how hospitals are not providing healthy food because we're doing a lot, at least Grant and I are doing a lot <laughs> to get there. Um, in our retail outlets, um, again, we identify if we have, we want whatever featured food, it's, it's the joke with the outreach committee, whatever featured food I have, I have it everywhere. When we were doing blueberries, I had it in the rice, I had it on the fish, it was in my salads, it's on my salad, it was everywhere. We have blueberries everywhere. So asparagus, not as much, but if there's a featured food, it's going to be pretty much everywhere. So these are the materials. So we get the posters that you can use and then identified all the Michigan dairies. And then this is the cling that I was talking about on our salad bar, um, saying that this was a Cultivate Michigan tomato. So these are Michigan tomatoes that they're eating. Um, and this is, we have digital menu boards in our cafeteria. <coughs> so we scan in the uh, posters and then put them, so that's right outside our cafeteria. So we use those there. This is as you walk into the cafeteria, so all the little information that we get provided, we include that um, as well. So they see it outside, they see it inside, they see it in front of them on their, probably sick of seeing it, but they're gonna continue. Oh, and then on our catering, we also do it. So we get, we put little tech cards for what the menu is. And honestly, I can't even see this one, but one of these is, oh, Michigan asparagus. That was Michigan asparagus again. Lauren, our catering menu. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm just, I want to make sure I'm clear about this. The Cultivate Michigan initiative is Beaumont's initiative? No. It's a statewide it's initiative. It's a statewide initiative. Farm to Institution Network. It's the initiative. Michigan Farm to Institution Network. It's initiative. And then Cultivate Michigan is the campaign. It's the campaign. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to take the day of poster session to come learn more. The other piece, we don't have the advantage of having all the, well, we have a lot of, of acreage, but it's all covered with buildings. So we, we don't have, a, we can't do a farm, we can't do a hoop house. We tried to do the, the garden on top of a new building they were building, but that got value engineered out, not so much. So what we did was we basically, we have a bunch of, we had a bunch of raised gardens right around my cafeteria where we do our farmer's market. So I'm, I'm not easily daunted, so, um, I knew I'd never be able to feed people from these gardens, but we do use it as a teaching garden. So we show them what, what is the potential. Um, and we also, um, you know, so we grow some products. We actually have master, my market manager is also a master gardener. So she's also a master composter. So, um, uh, and she's also my cafeteria manager. So it's, it's very convenient because she's all one and the same. I, I always tease her that someday she's gonna walk in and her, her, uh, je her jeans and her, scuffed up boots and her hat, you know. She hasn't yet. <laughs> she's still wearing her, her suits, but she's coming in in jeans someday, I just know it. Uh, but anyway, so she, um, we have hospital volunteers and we also have several master gardeners that work at, at Beaumont Royal Oak, so they help her with the gardens. She plants them and then they uh, help her maintain them. So we use raised, um, the raised beds that are around us um, and some window gardens to be able to at least demonstrate, you know, uh, the. The, the variety of things that you can do. 
Um, they don't use any commercial pesticides or herbicides. They use compost and uh, coffee grounds from our cafeteria and our Starbucks. Um, the volunteers are allowed to pick the produce. We don't use it anywhere other than some herbs we would use, but um, we just don't have enough that we get out of that tiny garden to really use anywhere. Um, uh, but our new feature this year, and you heard them talking about this, this is our take on the therapy garden. Oops, good lord, I'm too fast here. Um, so our therapy garden, our inpatient rehabilitation, we have several rehab units within the hospital for a variety of different things. Our neuro rehab floor brings patients down, the occupational therapists select patients, and they bring them down for a day of gardening as their actual therapy. So the master gardener selects what they're going to be doing if they're weeding, if they're pruning, or if they're harvesting. And then we've had, so we started it this year, probably mid-year. Um, we had over 30 patients that participated this year, and we got a really positive response from the patients. They get outside, they get out of the hospital, they get to, you know, play in the garden a little bit. This is a particularly fun story. She was asked, they were asking for stories earlier. Um, this young gentleman is a traumatic brain injury patient who had never had cucumbers before in his life for some odd reason. And he um, went down to the garden. This is the OT and this is the, the A. And actually that's my daughter in the green, so proud parent moment. Uh, but anyway, um, so he went down and picked cucumbers. They took them up, they washed them and sliced them. We gave him some fat-free ranch dressing. And he ate cucumbers and he shared them with the staff and it was such a great experience for to, for the staff upstairs to see him so happy that he, he was eating these cucumbers and he had never had them before. And so that's, how cool is this? That's the kind of, thing, that's the kind of stories that make all of this worthwhile. So that's my story. That's our, our flower guy at our farmer's market. I like to end with him. He sells out every time he comes. They love his flowers, so. Any questions from, well, are we doing questions or are we? Sure, yeah, fire away. Okay. Were your master gardeners staff or volunteers? <coughs> staff. So you have paid master gardeners? No, no. I have people who work for Beaumont who happen to be master gardeners. Just have and they come work. after work okay. Okay. to help with the garden. As a volunteer. As a volunteer. Okay. We have other volunteer volunteers, but we like having the master gardener. My, um, manager also after her day she goes out and works in the garden as her she volunteers her time the Michigan Farm to Institution Network is there work going on in Michigan this is directly related to hospitals but is there work going on with nursing homes schools I know schools but nursing homes specifically yes there. we actually had um, we also American had a child health. care person there yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And so American Health Senior Living is our best avenue right now, and we have um, Karen Jackson Holzauer, who's with the Area Agency on Aging in Southeast Michigan. She's involved in our outreach committee, but it's a space that we're really trying to develop. Yeah. Um, and I think we also have some action going on in Petoskey area. So with Sarah. Do you yeah. all consult with? communities around the state who want to start mm -hmm. a conversation with institutions? Is that part of your role? Yes. Okay. We can provide Great. that technical assistance. Great. Mm -hmm. Colleen and Lindsay are actually the two chairs of the Michigan Farm to Institution mm -hmm. Network. So anything you want to know about them, feel free to ask. We'll have a table outside. Yeah. You do have a table outside? Yeah, yeah they have a poster table. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got a question related. I was interested in your conversations with your primary vendor and how that relationship kind of evolved over time. Um, wondering what kind of, um, did that have a significant financial impact on, you know, if the, if the primary vendor is working to accommodate, you know, your desires around more local food access, did that dramatically change or, um, the cost of what I'm buying? Yeah. No. No. Okay. You're and I always balance. And I always, not necessarily, but I balance things on okay. the other end. I've been doing the budget stuff for a very long time, so I know where I can bend one area to, to meet the needs of another. So could you give me an example of balancing on the other end? Well, part of the other Healthier Hospital Initiative is uh -huh. to reduce meat consumption per meal. 
So at the same time, I'm reducing the volume of meat and I met that, I, I met the 20% the reduction in the first year I did it. So I'm spending less on meat. I so I might spend a little more on my produce. Not in all cases do I have to spend more. So would you have any tips um, for advocating for this method with our friends in finance? Well, I use measures of cost per meal, things like that, to benchmark. And as long as, you know, as I may benchmark at a benchmark level for cost per meal, then I think that's my argument that. So what you do is you, you, you would essentially bend the meal to, to meet the benchmark. And if you're doing that, then the finance is comfortable. All right. Got it. Thank you. Is your meat level? I do not have a lot of local meat because of my um, size. Because of your what? Size. Okay. Yes. I'm buying 1,200 pounds of commodity chicken a week, so mm. <laughs> oh, that's a little tough to... <laughs> Do you have a do you have a benchmark goal to hit as far as procuring local produce? Twenty percent by twenty twenty for overall local, right. not not separating produce. We include dairy in there, obviously. Okay, yeah. What are you What are you guys at right now? How close I'm I'm waiting to hear because I have a separate company that actually does my measurement, mm -hmm. but we've gone up. Since I started um, the really intense the last three years, I've gone up about four percent each year. So I'm I am bound and determined. I I will yeah. be twenty percent by twenty twenty. You have not been through uh, with the strict definition of I don't count things like locally roasted coffee because mm -hmm. I I would only count the coffee if somebody grew it in Michigan and processed mm -hmm. it in Michigan. So I don't count mm -hmm. and baked goods. I don't count any baked goods. Um, although the flower guy was interesting, I didn't know about him. Um, that she just mentioned. That flower. The the flower. No 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 no. The, the flower from Traverse City that I. That I don't know. a sample. Oh, oh, that's a sample. <laughs> Great. Um, but anyway, so I know some people count local baked goods, but my baked goods are actually made in the back of my kitchen because I have my own bake shop, but I don't count those as local. They're about as local as you can get, but but I don't count those. It has to be grown, processed, right here in Michigan. And you've yet to be through a uh, full season then with this new, I um, was interested in your relationship with Gordon and Pearson. Yeah. Uh, this is very No, it, it basically started in October. It took okay. us a year, well, 10 months <laughs> from when I went like this <laughs> and uh, the whole thing. So you're obviously, it's only February, you're going to get into a you know, full blown season here pretty soon. So we'll very that excited for that. Um, very excited. What are your ambitions then, or I should say, if they can't fill demand, I guess, um, back to your old ways of Looking buying in. your other avenues, um, what would those be? Well, more specifically, I guess, do you, you have people on site that would go buy direct, that um, if they couldn't provide, if your distributor couldn't pr provide something for you? It depends on, there are several factors, A, um, can you deliver it to me? So like that, when I I bought direct for the apples, for my apple crunch, mm -hmm. because they would deliver to me. I can't go get it. I don't have the uh, resources <coughs> to say, oh, if you have it, I can come. We did have an organic farmer in central Michigan who was going to do us, she has hoop houses and she was gonna do our own lettuce blend for us and it was all cool and I was all excited. And it was like, uh, that one was too much of a cost. That one, what I find, because they were going to deliver. So between them having to deliver and, and yeah. um, it was organic and all that, mm -hmm. that one I had to say, mm, no, I got to back off of that one because I do have to balance the cost. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I have a, a farm in, uh, up near Walla Lake, Wayne City, uh, a licensed facility, an uh, incubator kitchen. I also have a specialty food company, so everything I use is 100% local sourced organically, it's either grown at the farm or bought directly from the farmer. I currently don't use cherry capital, although I will need to as I scale up. But I have a line of prepared foods, all organic, plant-based, healthy prepared foods. I'm interested in selling uh, beyond stores. I'm interested in actually getting into a hospital setting where they don't seem to have in Northern Michigan any really healthy grab-and-go options. Is that something that I would have to be purchasing the, my inputs like fresh fruits and vegetables 
because that from GAP certified farmers and if, in order to have those, you know, as I value added, process those, package those, or because I'm licensed under Ag and Health Department, is that not necessary? I would talk to you offline about, you know, exactly what your processes are. If I'm certified, I get, you know, water testing, all of those things I have to go through as a licensed kitchen. As, you know, yeah, not so knowing what the products are and what they look like. Right. Um, I, you know, I'd certainly be happy to talk to you. Well, I'm thinking, for instance, going into a hospital setting, let's say I start with McLaren uh, or Munson, and I'm a provider of local foods that I've processed and added value to in terms of, let's say, it's a farro salad. Mm -hmm. Is that something that hospitals, you think, would be interested in because it's a more of a grab-and-go type of thing versus like their food line where they're making the food in-house? And I'm, instead, I'm delivering it so that they have other options for, let's say, prepared foods for their employees? Um, that's kind of a complex question as to who's, you know, how involved the, the hospital is with Healthy Foods yet, um, and how what the cost of your product would be to them versus what they can make on their own. Um, for instance, we don't tend to buy a lot of that kind of pre-made salad stuff. We make it ourselves. So it would really depend on who you were trying to talk to, right? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I would say that Maureen has uh, resources and infrastructure available to her that I wish I had. Every time I'm in a room with her, I get envious. Uh, but we do engage a lot of um, local, regional purveyors of things like that because we don't have the, I mean, labor is a, labor is a big issue when you start talking about this kind of stuff. And, um, and what helps me is I, is my volume. And I have two other hospitals in my system that I supply food to. So um, trust me, we do cost justifications. In fact, Grant and I were talking about it at lunch that my bake shop, I have had to cost justify it three times, but I've always proven that it's more cost effective for me to do it than buying a frozen product from my prime vendor, which would, to me, not be the same as having my freshly baked. Items. Are you required to require GAP certification or is that your choice? That's a standard that we use as our policy. And it's, it's your own standard. You've So there's no state or local regulations that say that needs to be a part of it, right? You have to understand that the people we serve are all at risk. You know, we have sure. a very fragile no, no, population, sure so we have to be very careful. Yeah. And um, that would seem like something that all hospitals would be concerned about. That. So uh, my question then is, are there uh, initiatives to help farmers get this gap? Well, there's Group Gap, which Kelly's been involved in, and um, I know they're at the <coughs> government level with the Food Safety Modernization Act. They're looking at, is GAP going to be the only um, certification that's allowed? But for us, we have to use the resources that are available to us at any given point. Sure. So, I mean... Yeah, a food board illness, not the, I like that she said the food board illness was <laughs> like, I'm going to use sure. that shamelessly, yeah. but, the, the, but the real food board illness is like a food service director's worst nightmare. Right, right. So you will do anything possible sure. to avoid yourself. that happening. <laughs> right. Right. Anything. So I don't want to eat too much in yeah, your time. I've only got nine slides. Cool. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we want to do your nine slides. Then we can do more questions. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good. And I was, it was nice to hear questions because I was curious as to, where we were at in terms of people in the room, like farmers, uh, institutional buyers. So who's who's from an institution looking to buy? Literally no one. <laughs> Two, three, four, four-ish kind of. And then everybody else is sort of on the farmer provider side of things. Okay. So a lot of a lot of what I put in my PowerPoint may or may not apply, but we'll just adapt as we move along. So this is a little bit of uh, background on. The health system in Southwest Michigan, Bronson Healthcare Group. Uh, these are our two primary hospitals, Bronson Methodist, Bronson Battle Creek. When Diane <coughs> asked me to come present, she asked that I highlight the fact that Bronson Battle Creek is in fact a contract managed account. Bronson Methodist has been is and has been self op for gosh eight nine years now probably. Uh, Different in scale, obviously more beds at BMH. It's a bigger, it's a bigger community, bigger hospital, more employees. We have about four thousand employees on campus at Bronson Methodist. So we're feeding a lot of meals, but not nearly as many meals as my counterpart. Um, and these are these are approximations. Again, you know, 
Uh, Maureen subscribes to a very, very strict local definition. We're a little bit more um, malleable in ours, uh, largely because we've been picking away at this for so long. And when we started doing it, we started we started doing it because we recognized it as a, a really meaningful economic development opportunity for the Kalamazoo area um, and a way to support and bolster a lot of small businesses. There was a comment made earlier this morning about a, um, a food incubation, like a small business food incubation hub, right? And that's something like that has existed in Kalamazoo for a long time. It's called the Can Do Kitchen and it's now joining forces with the Kalamazoo Valley Bronson Healthy Living Campus. So those will be housed together. You'll have light food processing and aggregation and then a small uh, small business incubation center. This is fundamentally why we why we do this work and why we believe it's important. Um, fostering a culture of health, we talked about making it cool to be healthy, right? And uh, and really ingraining that into the, the fabric of our community within the hospital but also the Kalamazoo community. And that's that's the fundamental building block of a lot of this work for us. I should say I guess before I go on that uh, in reference to the the contract, non-contract, because I think that comes up a lot when we start talking about buying and sourcing local food. Uh, it's possible to do it in both environments. It is infinitely easier to do it when you're self-op. So much easier. <laughs> uh, but it can be done. I mean, Battle Creek's doing it. You know, you have your 20% allowance for local food, and um, it's, it's important to remember if you are a customer contracting with a food service management company that that first part of that statement that you are the customer you're the customer you're paying Sodexo you're paying Aramark you're paying Touchpoint to deliver high quality services for you right and you you can hold them to that level of expectation you can negotiate into your contracts with them you can renegotiate out of contracts we've negotiated down to a uh, what we refer to as a co-sourcing agreement with Sodexo at our Bronson Methodist Hospital so we have access to their GPO. We don't need them for that access, but we use them for our, our inpatient meal service delivery software. Um, Bronson Battle Creek, they're full blown. I mean, they are those Sodexo employed managers in that hospital doing their work on behalf of, behalf of Sodexo and Bronson. Um, so it's not unreasonable to ask for those concessions from those companies. The flip side of that is if you're a farmer or a, a small food producer uh, attempting to work with a large institution, it's hard, right? I mean, you're talking about breaking down barriers, knocking on the right door, figuring out which, which avenue to source your product from or how to get it to someone like Cherry Capital who can, who can probably open some of those doors for you. And I think Cherry Capital, especially up in this region, is an incredible ally. I think we're really excited that they're working their way down the state towards us. We're over at your Yeah, Prime example, right there. Yeah. Um, Chicken. Things that we've found to be successful opportunities that some of our local growers, because we do all this local sourcing directly, so when I put that number up there, that percent local, I count nothing that comes from GF, GFS, Bird Food Service, US Foods, or Cisco, and we buy from all three. Uh, I don't count any of that because I have never, no one's ever been able to tell me with any degree of certainty that what's coming in my door from them is in fact a, a locally grown or produced product, right? So we just abandon ship on that and went the other route, which is to take their business away and vote with their dollars. And so we source directly from, most of our vegetables come from Crisp Country Acres, which uh, is a, an incredible family farm located in Holland, New Zealand. Our burgers come from peas. Uh, they had a processing facility and they raise cattle. They're down in Scotts Mill, Michigan. They're about 30 miles, not even away from Kalamazoo, out of Korea. Um, eggs, as I mentioned, if you were in the panel discussion this morning, it was all, all that is coming directly from the provider, from the farmer, from the grower, the producer. And uh, again, <laughs> Maureen is, is much more diligent in this than I am. Uh, we don't require, I mean, we don't ask about gap or anything like that. I mean, we go to the farm, we visit all the farms, we walk the processing facilities, but we know these people on a first name basis. <clears throat> uh, and I would say to the finance question, Michael, yeah. what has been most beneficial to us is that we've had top-down support on this from day one. This has yeah. been a priority <coughs> of our administrators from the get-go. So we do have to justify the financial end of things, and we have not increased our food costs across the department at a rate any higher than inflation or the cost of food has gone up on an annual basis anyway. But as Marie mentioned, you do that by getting creative. I mean, 
we were buying eight egg products, right? I said this earlier, now we're buying one. There's a lot of waste when you're buying that many different products. Uh, we were making jello. In fact, I think we might still be making jello or like buying number 10 cans of pudding and then we're paying someone to portion all that crap out, right? But that's time and that's labor yeah. that you could be spending peeling carrots or slicing celery or skinning potatoes or processing all this fresh, great food, right? You just have to reallocate those resources in the most meaningful way possible. So as an anchor institution, we believe very firmly that it's our responsibility uh, as such a player in the, in the community to, to support and bolster these small businesses. We're talking about millions of dollars here. We spend a third of our budget locally. And when I say a third, I mean I do count coffee, we count dairy. All that, that all translates to labor and economic development in our immediate area. All this work has resulted in a culinary school, right? I mean, these, these pieces and parts all weave together to, to really move massive ships. Um, the culture of health thing, we, we believe in that because a healthy culture, you know, you have healthier employees, you have happier employees, happier employees are, are more productive, right? There's lower rates of absenteeism. Um, they're at work more frequently. They're, they're kids, they're leading by example, so their kids aren't getting as sick. When a kid gets sick, the parent stays home, right? Then the parent's not productive. All these things funnel back into, into this, this notion of fostering a culture of health. A um, million dollars I mentioned that we're spending locally, I mean those dollars have helped grow Farmer Joe from a guy who's bringing 20 dozen eggs to a guy who's supplying 250 dozen eggs to a hospital, right? Um, we're working on similar things with chicken. And the underlying current here is this last point, which is that we have this tendency, historically we've had for decades now, this tendency to talk about food in the same context that we talk about sterile reprocessing and blue wrap and utensils and bolts and washers and doors and windows and all these like fundamental things, right? But those are widgets, those are things. Food is us. These are the fundamental building blocks of our, our livelihood, of our culture, of our society. And it needs to be treated as such. You have to look, you fundamentally, the institution has to look at it differently. You have to value food differently than you value pieces and parts. So this is, I mean, this is fun and relevant if you're from an institution and uh, you're trying to figure out how to get started, but it's been easy. It's been relatively easy for us. This, the, the food culture in Kalamazoo has been strong. Uh, we started out eight years ago with little things like CSA and guest chefs and farmers markets, and those are still going on. Those things are a ton of work, like a ton of work. Having the farmers, my Tuesday, we only run our farmers market in the winter because our, we're in such close proximity to our Kalamazoo market, that thing shuts down and we open up, we shut down and it opens up. So we run it for 15 or 16 weeks. It is my entire day, my entire day, like 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. every Tuesday for 15 or 16 weeks. <coughs> Setting up tables, moving chairs, putting on table skirts, printing signage, all these things, right? Burning cats. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, but it's meaningful. It's helped. <laughs> It's helped to foster that, that um, support within the walls of the hospital. People get excited about it. I mean, we were doing, in the early days of the farmer's market, we were running like 50 people through, right? And the farmers and the vendors who were there were walking home with like 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 100 bucks in a big day, right? I said this earlier this morning. Somebody walked out of our market the other day, and these are only transactions that I process through our cash register, so this doesn't count cash. In three and a half hours, they'd, they made a thousand bucks. There were 400 people that walked through that market on Tuesday. On a Tuesday in the winter, buying fresh produce. These, there's not like, we're not knitting things and there's not chocolate. This is like <clears throat> vegetables, meat, cheese, <laughs> eggs, <clears throat> real food. This is exciting stuff. People get really jazzed about this market. The CSA, we have about 150 participants year round. We run the CSA year round. We pushed it back on the, uh, the farmer a little bit this year because I couldn't humanly manage all of that anymore. Um, and I lost my, my colleague who actually moved to the east side of the state. So, uh, so what they did is they, they fully embraced it. They took it on. They built a website specifically for our employees. They offered the wholesale price discount that we enjoy as a, a bulk purchaser. They offered it to our employees on a person-to-person -person basis. They can jump on, anyone in the hospital can jump on any, any Monday of the year, year-round, fill their basket with poultry, meat, eggs, vegetables of their choosing, and it gets dropped off at the hospital on Thursday, <coughs> year-round. So the CSA is now a year-round thing. Um, small, simple things like establishing relationships with people that your administration can identify with, right? 
So whether you're a CEO or you're an environmental service employee, you love a muffin, right? Or you like a bagel or you drink a cup of coffee. You probably do that somewhere in your community. Figure out how to make those direct relationships with people who your employees and your team identify with. Those are easy, easy stepping stones. Bigger things, um, ground beef. We switched all of our hamburgers a few years ago. This is probably four or five years ago. So every, every hamburger we serve in the hospital, patient or visitor, is a locally raised grass-fed beef hamburger processed by peas 30 miles away. That was a big swing back in the day. More recently, farmers to move on my side. <laughs> <laughs> and we're rich. So Maureen is rich in, in resources of one kind. We're rich in resources of another kind, mm -hmm. right? And and figuring out how, maybe that's what we maybe we need another lane on I ninety four, which is just for like <laughs> <laughs> food transit back and forth. Um, and then educational materials. You know, we business opportunity. Who's listening? Distribution. <laughs> so as Marie mentioned, there's there's opportunities everywhere to to educate and to teach and to. Um, reinforce the, the value in doing this work with your employees. This year we're going to start a, we're going to start a program where we're um, harnessing the, the power of the physician and the mid-level provider and the uh, executives who are leading by example, right? We're going to put them on signage and we're going to give them a blurb, we're going to tell them what to say, we're going to post those signs all over the place. We do it right now for like creating a healing environment, right? Like, shh, my wife is healing, please keep the noise level down. We're going to roll it into food. We've really blown it, like really blown it a few times, right? We've overcommitted, you get really excited. Somebody mentioned, oh, you mentioned that people come to you now, right? You start doing this work and people see dollar signs. We have a $3 million food budget at one hospital. 30% um, of that, it's a million dollars. You break that up, I mean, that's a, a million dollars in a massive healthcare institution is really, talking about a billion dollar business, a million dollars is pennies, right? But the 20 to 30 grand that you are spending directly with a local grower, producer, or buyer, that could be half their cash flow for a year. You know, those are, it's big coin. And we overcommitted. We started working with way too many people. Like everybody has a good idea. Everybody, everybody's making a great cupcake and their friends tell them they should open a cupcake business. Or everybody's making, there's a thousand people making granola in Kalamazoo, I swear to you. <laughs> and that doesn't do anyone any good when you're not, thoughtful and when you set, when you allow false expectations to, to perpetuate, you set yourself and the people you're working with up for failure in, in a lot of ways. So I think the, the greatest takeaway, we would do the same thing with chicken. This is worth noting. We had a passing conversation with one of our meat processors about our need for chicken and somebody overheard it and threw down a bunch of chickens. And then came to us and said, I have all these chickens now. You want to buy chicken for me? I have like 30,000 chickens running around in my backyard. And I'm like, I can't break down a chicken. I don't, even, I don't know how, I physically don't know how to break down a chicken, right? And you don't have the labor dollars, the resources, or the facility available to you to do that. So the conversation has to start by getting all those people in the room, being exceedingly transparent about everyone's needs, everyone's ability to produce, and it's going to take more than one person. One chicken provider is not going to raise enough chicken beef ever. <coughs> And if they can, you don't want it, probably, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, along with the failures, we've, we've done some really great stuff. Pasture-raised beef, I alluded to earlier. Um, when we introduced the hamburger, the sales of hamburgers dropped by 50%, <coughs> right? 50%, we, sell, we sold a lot of hamburgers. We doubled the price, it went from $2 to four. People started eating one hamburger instead of two which is fine, <laughs> perfectly okay, <clears throat> but it's all really good beef. We put out a locally baked bun. We have some really fantastic organic cheese that we get from Grassfields Farms uh, mm -hmm. west of Grand Rapids. And, sorry to interrupt, but that's part of your question too. If, it, if we use these things in the retail areas, we have the opportunity to charge for what we're using. The patient side, not so much, but on the retail side, that's another answer to that question. Right. If you're, especially if you're using organic, you, you have to use you have to raise prices for that. Right. And, it's, and it can become an offset. You know, I mean, that's, that can be, you know, we sell all these eggs, right? And that helps to offset the cost of the, putting the eggs on the inpatient menu, except that eggs are a bad example because they saved us a ton of money this year. Like a ton of money. Not me. <laughs> that little guy. This, I had a really bad this year. This is the egg shell right here. That's, that's, that's a picture. the egg machine? Yeah, this is the little egg machine. So it's, it shells them? It's, 
Well, it shells them, it breaks the shell, <laughs> and then the liquid comes out. Yeah, it's really great. I mean, it can, we could shell all those eggs that are stacked next to it, I bet, in less than five minutes. I heard it's got machines this morning, but I didn't get to crack the shells for you. Yeah, and they only crack as they break. You would, we would never have enough labor to crack, crack eggs. Yeah, I know, it's not possible. We started, we talked about that the first time, and I just had this vision in my head of, like two people standing over steel bowls <laughs> cracking four <laughs> eggs at a time, right? There's no way this is going to work, guys. It's not possible. Um, but we had, and we had a very crucial conversation with our local health inspector about the egg machine because it's something that they hadn't seen. They hadn't, uh, it, it probably hasn't, I think it's made in Spain, actually. It's, obviously, it's European. They can do whatever they want. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, you better hope it never breaks. <laughs> Room by that. Parts will be impossible. Right. Uh, but taking advantage of things like this to make it possible to use lettuce like this that is grown in the field that doesn't come in a bag, I mean, we can dry 20 pounds of lettuce in that little Hobart dryer right there, right? It's making things that are seemingly impossible on the scale that we're talking about very, very possible. This, by the way, is Norm, I mentioned to him earlier. Norm raises the chickens. He also raises a lot of the pork that we buy. You dry your own lettuce? Yeah, so when fresh lettuce comes out in the beginning of the year, we actually just recently stopped because there are a few people who grow greenhouse lettuce around us. Uh, but that fresh lettuce that comes out of the field, we have to wash, chop, dry, and then distribute the farmer doesn't do that. No, 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 the farmer doesn't. That'd be neat. Mm -hmm. neat if they did. But we're counting on that. Uh, we're counting on the Kalamazoo Valley Community College um, food hub to, to handle a lot of that for us. Not just for us, but for the community at large. I'm skipping a lot of material, guys, because I feel like it's not relevant to the people in the room. Um, about $60,000 in it a year we spend on eggs, which is big. Again, for us, it's relatively small. And actually, eggs were awash, so if, if nothing else had happened, if the low cholesterol thing hadn't happened, if the avian flu thing hadn't happened, if we had just simply started buying farm fresh eggs versus what we were paying for all the other egg product that we were already buying, absolutely wash. So it is a fallacy that it is more expensive to do this all the time. Go ahead. And also, they're non-GMO feed, they're pasture-raised chickens, they're, these are real eggs. Go ahead, sorry. Worked in hospitals for a long time, and I'm really interested in what Maureen said. It, it, the difference between, you say, well, Maureen's more fastidious about the legal piece and the gap and all that, and where you just buy it straight. And, you know, from a previous hospital employee and administrator point of view, you know, I'm just wondering, this is just, I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if, if, I know in large systems, often, you know, if there's not a problem, then the legal department doesn't know really what's going on, mm -hmm. if, you know, mm -hmm. but, so, because I'm wondering if there was a proactive conversation about what if mm -hmm. there were, um, what if we had a foodborne illness break out in the hospital and it was revealed that we bought straight from these farmers that were not, there was no standardization in their certification and so that brings on lawsuits, which is a huge, huge, huge thing for institutions. Was there a proactive conversation about that? And if not, then the, you know, the sustainability of mm -hmm. this whole system for you can't, could seem from some people's point of view, um, very unstable because you get one outbreak of legionnaires or one outbreak of something and then all of a sudden someone said that legal department says you have to start buying totally from Gordon Foods in cans because there's no way that you can do this we're not protected right uh, it's a so I did have that proactive conversation however um, Unless you're, you can have those conversations all day unless your administration's on board. It doesn't matter, right? right? And I would love to see, and I've been saying this for a long time, but I'd love to see a, I'd love to see a comparison of foodborne illness outbreaks stemming from small local regional farms versus foodborne illness outbreaks stemming from all of the processors That's who provide right, food exactly. Food Which food is food. what the legal department will have to do the research on if they have to defend you in court. Sure, right, sure, right. sure. And, and my, which would be fabulous. Our corporate attorney's response to me when I asked that question a few years ago was, we're going to get sued either way, so. Yeah. yeah That's what your administration says? That's what our corporate attorney says. That's just fabulous. 
point. But I mean, you, having leadership like that's really important. It makes a huge. Yeah. It does. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. I feel it feels unfair to even stand up here and say these things that we're doing to you because I know that we're in a unique situation. Well, I think the farmer has their own standards too. They get inspected, and they're, they're, they're selling to the community just like I get inspected. So I can't just go out. outside the farmer's market. There's a the cottage food law. Of course. Once you step beyond that, so an egg, somebody's selling eggs, is inspected. They have to wash them. Whereas, like a farmer goes out to the field and they cut their lettuce, they put it out to the farm market. They're legally allowed to do that. They're not allowed, however, to process it and wash it unless they have a facility that's licensed. So there's really a lot of kind of stop measures. There's a lot of things in place along the food chain yeah. Yeah. that we all work around. That's a nice thing to hear for those of us yeah. thinking about how to have that conversation with hospital administrators who may say, "No way, uh, we can't be assured that we're getting clean food from." <coughs> Farmer Joe. No, Emily makes a really great point is that there are a lot of stop gaps, gaps in existence already, and many of these things that we point to as, um, I mean, they are additional measures, but every additional measure is an additional obstacle, right, to making this food system work. And so there's a lot in place, yeah. Norm's got a licensed facility. Uh, Peas is a USDA licensed meat processing plant, right? Economic impact, million dollars a year we're spending in our local community, right? Quarter of a million dollars Battle Creek on contract, on a Sodexo contract, quarter of a million dollars Battle Creek will be spending here pretty soon. I'm reading from notes that are attached to these slides. <laughs> so if, you, if any of you, I assume no one's going to go online and, and download these slides. But the notes are there and the, the stats and the, the data is in there as well. Um, we removed all the deep fryers, as I mentioned earlier. We substituted French fries and chicken tenders with healthy, vegetables and uh, kale salads, little like cup size 16 ounce kale salads that we, we cannot make fast enough. Like we make them on a Monday, they're gone Tuesday morning. Um, carrots and little like low fat ranch dip, right? Celery and a little bit of peanut butter. These are simple ways. It's, it's like kids food. It's like you design a kids menu for adults. If it's there and it's beautiful and it's abundant, People will buy it. We buy muffins and bagels and the, we, we diet on the brown and yellow diet because it is what is abundant, right? It is what we are accustomed to. This food can look so much prettier than that food. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that our market is infinitely busier than it, than it has been. We've revived, uh, I don't think I, had, I took it off. We have a little positive choice logo that we developed years ago and basically stopped using because it required too much of my energy, I think. But we've revived it with the help of our RDs, and we identified all of the foods, most of the foods in our, in our retail and patient dining facilities that meet positive choice. Uh, in the retail cafes, we dropped the price 2 to 5%. So we lowered the cost of the unhealthy food. Everything else, we didn't raise the price on unhealthy food. We lowered the price of healthy food to incentivize people to buy more of it. This is an experiment. I did not make this argument to our finance department. Um, it could go either way. My suspicion is that, based on what I've seen over the course of one month and how fast we are selling these healthy food items, our numbers are going to go up. We're going to make more money this year than we did last year. This is, um, I've been really harping on economic impact because what we're doing and what we're talking about, especially as anchor institutions, we're the drivers of our local economy, right? It is incumbent upon us to, to be good stewards of that responsibility. This is 10 acres, so this is our hospital right here in the yellow. This is 10 acres of land that was formerly an, an EPA, uh, what's the term? Where you can't like it. Brown height. Brown height. It's bad. It's really bad. <laughs> and it's also on our creek. Right? This is the Portage Creek that flows along our new bike trail and flows into the Kalamazoo River. 50, 45 to 50 million dollars of investment later, the creek bed has been widened by the EPA. It's been naturally planted. It's also in a, in a hundred year flood plain. Um, so soil has been brought in, everything has been abated. This land is being utilized. Here we have greenhouses, uh, there'll be raised beds. This is the food innovation hub here where they're gonna be doing light minimal processing of fresh foods. This is the culinary school where we're gonna be teaching institutional cooks how to prepare and work with fresh local food. And then down here I made mention of the uh, Kalamazoo, Mentor, Kalamazoo Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Every time it's a little bit uh, the heaviest, some of the heaviest users of our ER are now going to have meaningful work within a block of where they're receiving their services, right? And then this is the building. This is like this is economic development. That is a building being built on a former brownfield. 
adjacent to the hospital where we're going to teach people to cook real food. This work is it's more than just putting carrots on plates. This is serious, serious business. This is millions of dollars we're talking about. Jobs, education, so many things wrapped up in this. Grant's not passionate about it. It's no. really exciting. <laughs> I wish you'd get excited about it. And when you, watch it, when you watch it unfold across the street from where you go to work every single day, when you drive down a street one day where for the last seven and a half years it's been nothing but a wasteland, and all of a sudden things are happening. I mean, these greenhouses are gorgeous, right? This is the... This is the diagram that uh, Rachel Bear and um, her team at KDCC used to illustrate where the Food Innovation Center fits into our local food economy. So that it doesn't, it, it serves only as a to be a catalyst for our local farmers, for our institutions, right? It does not cut anyone out of the loop. It doesn't take a, a chunk of anyone's paycheck. It serves only to bolster the local food economy. I mentioned this earlier this morning, I assume most of you were in that room too, but we're transitioning, as Maureen said, our inpatient menu to a cardiac general diet for a lot of reasons, simplicity for one, streamlining our products another, but also that it, it just seems logical. Healthy food can be delicious and we should all be eating healthy food, right? There's no reason we need to have high sodium and low sodium things. Just find a reasonable amount and make it taste good. <clears throat> Hormone, antibiotic, GMO free chicken collaboration. We have been having conversations over the course of the last year with a few different chicken farmers as well as beef in our area who we just are fortunate enough to have developed these relationships with. And our, our aim is to get them all together in one room and establish a chart of course forward to not just source the chicken they're already raising, but to, to meet the needs and the demand of our institutions and other institutions in our community and have that chicken grown, and raised, processed and delivered within our community because then the infrastructure is there, right? Schools, 75 years from now, will be able to use this chicken <laughs> when, the, when their budgets catch up. Um, other hospitals in town who aren't doing, or who aren't making as much progress on this as we are. Um, Western Michigan University, Kalamazoo College, Kalamazoo Valley Community College, I mean, there are a lot of people, a lot of institutions eating a lot of food and right now they're not eating the best food. I hope as soon that will be possible. That's all I got. More questions? I, I do. Yeah. Have you collaborated with any other health systems in the state of Michigan? Because it seems like what you're doing is really very well planned and you've got good short term goals, good long term goals. Um, it doesn't seem like money is such an issue <laughs> because I'm from Traverse City and I find that sometimes we get um, some kind of financial issue pushback mm -hmm. as far as like putting farms local produce on a patient tray. I mean, I, yeah. I've spent some time in the hospital and I'm still surprised at how little we can get the local food under patient trays. It's in the cafeteria, you can buy a squash, yeah. but it's not getting to the patients and it seems like you're doing that very well. Medium well, I would say. I think we could do it much better than we are. Yeah. But I think that, um, and I would, I would be interested in Maureen's response to this too, but a lot of that boils down to the context that you put that work in, right? So we serve, call it 4,000 meals a day at Bronson Methodist, patient and retail. But three quarters of those are not patient meals. Three quarters of those are retail meals that represent an opportunity to make a few pennies more to offset the cost of pushing, putting it on the patient tray. Um, it is, it's so, the shifting cost is so small. And when you put it in the context of an entire healthcare system and the value that everyone, I think in our culture, not everyone, but many people in our culture, certainly in this room at this point, are recognizing the value in having that, that fresh, real food without the antibiotics, without the, with the antibiotics that's in the food that account for 75% of the antibiotics that are used in the country, right? And not the 25% that we're feeding our patients. <laughs> It's, it becomes very easy when you find that, what seems like a big number when you're talking only about chicken or only about bread or only about eggs, relative to the $170,000 a year that we spend on chicken, 4,000 pounds of chicken a month, um, it's big, right? It's big in the context of chicken. It's relatively big in the context of food. It is like an eyelash in the context of the entire healthcare system or the, the cost of one healthcare, one institution. What do you think? Um, part of it is, it sounds easy and it sounds, there's a lot of nuances to the whole thing. Like, I have the 
support to charge in my cafeteria what I need to charge. Some hospitals are more reluctant. They require administrative approval every time you want to change a price. You know, so it's not just, um, there's a lot of different factors that go into this. Whether or not they'll support, you know, they're even interested in the whole local movement and, you know, or, or is that not something that's on their boilerplate. Um, but, but things like being able to charge more if you need to charge more, some food service directors don't have that opportunity. So they, they don't have the, you know, so then they have to figure out how else can they balance or even can they balance, you know, by, by doing this. Um, I mean, we're fortunate in, in that regard. I'm sure you have the same uh, leniency with what you charge. Um, but even, even myself in the same, being in the same system, there's just, I have a, another hospital that the CEO is much more reluctant. He doesn't like raising prices in the cafeteria because it's not popular. And, and honestly, um, he talked about changing the fryer in his cafeteria, we did it, or you know, not frying food. We did it several years ago. I was like afraid to walk to my car for a long time because <laughs> you know you, you'd think most people would be grateful and happy that you know that we're doing this. Well, there's a whole lot of there's another contingency out there who does not want you to be the food police. They are not happy with the changes. We did a all healthy vending too. We have. We have, he has his, your program, which was the positive choice, ours is my healthier choice. So we required everything going in our snack vending machines to be, meet our criteria, which is basically the Heart Association guidelines with a couple extra additives to it. Um, that was another initiative that was very, very, very unpopular. And, uh, and uh, I was, uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a system at the hospital where employees can voice their opinion called My Voice. Um, I had the record for my voices uh, for about three months. Uh, HR is usually the top contender. I'm usually not too far behind them. But um, yeah, I was definitely winning there for a while. And um, so even the physicians were not too happy because we also took candy bars out of the gift shops. And uh, we did a whole lot of things to try to improve. So it's, it's not always, sometimes you have to fight some battles even when you think you're doing the right thing. Um, it doesn't mean everybody thinks you're doing the right thing. Um, so they, uh, or they may not want to pay a little bit more because you're serving um, an antibiotic-free sausage that was made in uh, a very nice little area of Detroit. But um, you know, so you're encroaching on the free choice, right? Yeah. 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 To which I said, <laughs> Popeyes just opened like a half mile away. By all means, right. they, they do a better job of fried chicken than we do anyway. But that, but that brings the challenge to you to make sure that you're healthy, as Grant has said, make sure you're healthy is tasteful and appealing. And we, we worked very hard when we took the fryer out. When we took the fryer out, french fries were my number one top volume dollar sales in my cafeteria. Wow. My top volume dollar sales right now is my salad bar. But we did a whole conversion of that salad bar and to make it appealing, put the right things first, um, limit, you know, things that, uh, the hardest thing to find, and another challenge that we have is um, food manufacturers. Like to try to find a low salt, low fat salad dressing. Next to impossible, you can find the salt or you can find the fat. But, so you're even trying to be healthier, ignoring the local piece of it um, can be difficult. But you have to you have to work hard to make sure that that is more appealing than what they're used to eating too. So we did it though. French fries have fallen down by the wayside because they're not French fries anymore. They're something else. So <laughs> they're kind of gone. Though. Now salad bar is number one, which made me very happy. Do you have a go-to book or uh, maybe a YouTube, some kind of video that you would think you would uh, recommend for uh, initially giving? Uh, administrators um, to help them get the message and or staff. I mean, like what you said about it, you're afraid to walk to your car. I mean, it is. It was a joke. I was kidding. I, mean, I, was, I wasn't physically so threatened. That, that's a good but I did get a lot of grief in the hall. You do. Uh, you get a lot of resistance, of course. And we're talking about leadership and how it's so important to have strong leadership yeah. who's on board. But not nobody just pops, you know, in this culture. We've all had. 
unless you grew up in a health food hippie hand family, right? We've all made our own food <coughs> transitions to the healthier side. And that's over time, and a lot of it's just opportunity and luck that we were in the right place at the right time, or, you know. So is there a particular uh, information, you know? Yeah, so Daphne seemed pretty cool. So what? Daphne seemed pretty cool. Smart, yeah. Right? I mean, that feels like a good starting point. Also, uh, she does seem cool, but I can't afford to bring her to Muskegon. Oh, well, yeah, but you can afford it. <laughs> PBS is currently streaming the In Defense of Food documentary. Thank you. Free. Thank you very I think, much. Just I think Michael know. Pollan is a great, re yeah. Michael Pollan's early, you know, Omnivore's Dilemma yes, is a really yes, great yes. resource. Right. Um, I remind me of the CEO. Of In Defense of Food is being streamed Rob right Cassidy. Rob Cassidy. Rob Cassidy. Yeah, yeah so. he's, he's great and he's in the state and putting an emphasis on, on being healthy, right? In fact, they wanted him at this conference and he was busy, they got me. <laughs> <laughs> but you were good. Wonderful. You were great. I owe you one. There's also uh, the Michigan I Green Healthcare Conference every year. Um, that strives yeah. to bring some of this leadership both nationally and locally. So Rob was the keynote last year there. That's right. Yeah. The key is that um, you have enough support so that when the grief comes, yeah. that they're not just going to turn it back around. Exactly. And when you know when they're storming the the office to say how dare they do this, that they don't say oh well maybe we you know maybe you. and we we've, we've never experienced that. We've always had that support to say yeah. And this is something a, we need to do. Having a, a lead like Maureen and I would put myself in that in that same classification within the walls of the hospital to be willing and able to go out and like take that abuse and put a positive spin on it. I mean it's it's a lot about being armed with information. I mean, Maureen's yeah. presentation is incredibly information rich. Uh, when we took the friars out, we put a survey out, we gave ourselves a month of runway across the hospital because we knew we were doing it. There was going to be dissatisfaction, right? Despite all the work that we've done, and as popular as the market, the CSA, and all this is, people want French fries and chicken tenders. It's comfort food. It's easy. Um, we asked for recipes. We asked for suggestions for alternatives. We asked for family recipes. We asked for feedback across the board. What would you like to see on the deli sandwiches? How would you like to see the pizza area change? What else would you like to see on the salad bar? I mean, diffuse that energy across as many outlets as possible and put as positive a spin on that as, as you can. Um, it goes a long way. It, it really does. And I've heard more, I'm sure I don't hear all the feedback, I know I don't, but I've, I have personally heard more positive feedback about the, the removal of the fryer than I have heard negative, which is nice. Would you both be willing to provide your slides? Because they're going to be on the screen. Yeah, they're going to be on the resource. Yeah. How do we access those? I think at the website, the food photos and the help. Or okay. food help. Share those on the follow-up. Great, I had a couple of questions. Yes. Yeah. Just to shift gears a little bit back to the supplier side of things. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any examples for, I'd like to know what you go through as far as from the grower like, to your institution, that supply chain. Um, That's a Maybe an example, but also your challenges, what you would like to um, see to make that easier. Um, I guess explain that a little bit more. Yeah, so the, the supply chain for most of our local stuff right now is the grower, the producer, to our back door. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of our vegetables come in in the black plastic farm crates. You're direct then with a lot of farmers? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and they're delivering direct to the yep. hospital? Yeah, process uh, uh, invoices for probably 50 or 60 different local, local suppliers on a weekly basis. Um, it requires a little more work. We're really, obviously, for obvious reasons, very excited about the KDCC campus and their ability, potential ability to maybe add one layer of processing, or yeah. light processing, to get it to us in a more ready to use state. But uh, all along the way, we've been adapting and developing and, and changing our systems internally so that we can manage it as best we can. I mean, mm -hmm. the lettuce is a great example. We were washing, chopping, and drying lettuce three years ago. And you have to figure out ways to move people around. Um, so yes, the vast majority of it is, is direct, very direct, which you got to be, there's a level of comfort that you have to be uh, willing to achieve there, too. I mean, those guys are, Norm is in my dairy cooler. Like, he is walking in with right. crates of eggs and setting them in the cooler and then walking out. Uh, Do you see any downside, I guess, to that, I should say, as far as work on your end? And then, obviously, they're helping out by coming directly yeah. to you. 
but um, that's a lot of your time, obviously. It, <laughs> it's not, that. so we have a buyer. We, we implemented a buyer position a few years ago. We took, a, we took a position that already existed, somebody through attrition and vacated it, we turned it into a, a department buyer. So this individual's responsibility is um, managing, monitoring, and, and building out our inventory control process and managing relationships with farmers, knowing how much, we be, how much beef we have on hand and how much do we need to order. So that also so that the vendors have one point of contact so that they're not calling six different managers or chefs or whatever. Yeah. And that has been, from an institutional standpoint, very, very meaningful for us. Uh, I don't personally see any downside with the direct relationship. I think it's, it's, if anything, a benefit. I mean, the hospital employees see the farmers walk around the hospital, they recognize them from the farmer's market. It, I mean, it's, that's it. Like, you, you see, you're seeing the person who grew your food, which is, yeah. I think, goes a long way in terms of the relational thing. Did you have a question? Uh, the bio question. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised I haven't heard much about the kind of the soft sell of doing this from a branding standpoint from, you know, the institution. Because you, I know you have to talk a lot about the financial side of weighing things out. But what impact do you, do you see from a branding standpoint, from Beaumont to what you do to what maybe other hospitals could be doing? And how could you measure that impact within the community? How, how we look back at you versus a cold, you know, sterile hospital and somebody that, like, what you're doing is incredibly innovative. That's not happening yet up here. I think it's coming closer, but I don't even think anybody from where I am came to this event um, mm -hmm. other than food, the farmers, the food providers, but no hospitals or institutions. So, how do you go about saying, you know, what from that standpoint, forget the, forget the finance, she's or how, she's or about the, the, you know, the impact from the branding standpoint, the marketing, I the food. Was it, you, you mean the way that the community views your institution? Is that essentially your Do you do a terrible job at that? In my opinion, uh, I think we, there's a lot of opportunity to do a better job of that. Uh, but then again, every time you have, every time your organization has a positive relationship with someone else in the community, they become your brand ambassadors mechanically, right? So we go to the farmers market, and a lot of people identify with me walking around. Um, we work with a lot of nonprofits. I sit on a lot of boards and committees around the community, so our names are associated in positive ways with a lot of different organizations. But in terms of forceful branding. I think it speaks for itself. It's authentic. You're doing it for the right reasons. And does your they make great values. Does your competition, are they trying to do the same thing, or have you found that you have? Uh, <laughs> I, not in my community. They're not trying to do So here's an example. Uh, the Henry no. Ford Hospital has um, a greenhouse. They are housed in their publicity department. That's where that piece sits. So there are groups that do that. Did you say they're housed in their publicity? What does that mean? Mm, yeah, like, so there's a more about the publicity, or is there more? No, his, uh, the farmer's <laughs> boss is the <coughs> chief marketer. Yeah. yeah. And that's who you talk to. You want to when, more about it. When that hospital was built, though, <laughs> there was a, a specific intent with, I mean, there was, it was not just the, um, the farm itself. It was a lot of different things that that was being built as the hospital of the future for a lot of different reasons, not just, so that's where that's more in the forefront. You know, um, not necessarily, you know, the other hospitals within the system. It, it was all focused on this new, this is the, the model mm -hmm. hospital for this kind of yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's, well, I don't think it's a bad thing. thing. Um, I think it's interesting that they have, that that's their, public interface, you know, that this is what they want to be known for, is that they have a farm and that they work directly with their cafeteria, and you walk through that, their atrium, and it's not, it doesn't feel like an institution, it feels like you're outside. Um, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely wonderful. But there are lots of different models for how this can work. Well, and I'm here from Lens Center, so, um, so I guess in from what I hear with you guys, um, you know, you have this huge community already. So when you're branding it, we get a lot of produce directly from farmers too, and do little specials and stuff. And so you're you're really just doing it for for that community. So you know, and talking to people here while I was there, 
have been to the hospital, and like, that's where your word of mouth comes from, the branding and art on how we do it. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you know, we don't need to reach out too much farther um, because we're touching so many people coming through the cafeteria. And we're, I mean, we're doing the self branding by putting on the patient menu when there are Michigan items that those are Michigan items, and we identify them in our retail areas. Our farmers market is open to the public, so we get a lot of local residents who come to the market every week, um, and also, uh, you know, family members come down to the market uh, you know, who are visiting the patient. Uh, we have IV poles going through the the, uh, <laughs> the market half the time. Patients come down with their family members, and uh, so I mean, I and and you know, obviously that goes. Out. Our farmers market is very well known in the area. It's very popular. We have people literally. I get calls. I and the market manager um, get calls. I'm sure I get one at least one a week from someone wanting to come to our farmers market, and uh, we've. Uh, we had one specific area initially that we recovered and it was great. We were had like the perfect location. Well now we're kind of creeping out, so it's like we didn't have to make them bring tables or tents or anything, but we're like, well, we're out of the bounds now. So if you want to come, bring your tent because you're gonna be out in the in the elements if not. So but that's a good thing that we want to have more people wanting to be involved and uh, more people coming. So and the farmers are very happy, like like grants. Um, they, they do very well while they're there, and they're happy to be there. Grant, have you had, had any problems with volume? You said you were <coughs> a lot of growers, like 50 to 60. Uh, you said, Maureen, when you were speaking, uh, one of your biggest issues is you work in volume, so that's a challenge to get enough of that local produce. Um, you know, you're working with a bigger distributor, obviously. You're dealing with 11, I'm sure, huge farms. And then you've got smaller farms. You do have a smaller population where you are probably, too. But how does that, um, I guess, affect your business? It's a lot more work to deal with 50 or 60 people than if you were to just deal with a couple. Um, I guess, where do you, where do you see yourself in that picture? Is, it, is there a problem there, or is that? It's not been a problem. Uh, it just seems logistically like it could uh, kind of hurt you if you get, if you run out of supply and there's too many suppliers, <coughs> you kind of start working backwards. And the 50 to 60, I should clarify, I mean, that spans our entire Local purchasing initiatives. Okay. So I'm, I'm in the produce industry. So I'm, yeah. I'm more curious about the produce. Yeah, yeah. So the produce, we we have never, to my knowledge, run into a significant supply challenge. We are again much smaller than yeah. Maureen's operation, uh, and we are also surrounded by more farmers than I think you're surrounded by. Uh, we work so a lot of our cities. <laughs> right. A lot of our produce come from a few, a few. Uh, farmers, but they are they are of a scale that and they're able to meet yeah. what you ours and people. some. I mean, they're in the community delivering to restaurants. And Do you guys have a similar goal as far as twenty percent or twenty twenty? Uh, were you working off your own? Yeah, we own goals. We use we use sixty percent, um, but again, by twenty twenty. I don't put a date on it. <laughs> we hover around 33, 34 now, but you know, like like Maureen mentioned, she she follows a much more strict, um, is it the MHA guideline? The healthier hospitals. Healthier hospitals. So we don't count baked goods that are local, we don't count coffee, we don't, you know, unless, again, it's grown and raised, grown and or raised and processed within 250 miles of us, we don't count it, so. With that, We've come to the end, and there is a uh, closing keynote speaker, so we want to make sure that everybody gets to that. Um, Mary Brower of Stone Farm. So we had a poster session. And there's a poster session. And there's a poster session. So we have our poster session. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So if you guys would fill out to our surveys. Thank you. Thank you.